Hi, everybody. We're live here at Speak Up Monday every Monday here at Tropical Nomad. This is episode number 330. And, and today you have a wonderful guest, uh, Malati Rianto Wason. I had to I had to practice. Nailed it. I had to practice how to pronounce the surname, but I did it. The founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags, Utopia. The rest I'm going to read from the phone because there's so much. So let's go. A full-time change maker and movement builder. She founded Bye Bye Plastic Bags at the age of 12. Mamma mia! Since then, Malati has spoken on stages such as TEDx and the UN. She recently co-chaired the World Economic Forum GRAP Committee, sat on the inaugural expert advisory panel for Earthshot Prize, and has, and has had her film, I didn't even know you had a film, Bigger Than Us premiere at the 74th Cannes Film Festival 2021. And today, Malati launched her new company, Youthtopia, which is all about focusing on youth empowerment through short, meaningful, peer-to-peer -peer programs and providing them the tools they need to be change makers just like yourself. That is another round of applause, because that was an intro. So welcome to the show, Malati. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. 330, what a lucky yes. number. Can't yeah. believe it. Very honored to be here today. Yeah. You know, like, with all of that large intro, the large in life in intro, like, how do, you, how do you manage to stay grounded? I mean, you're 21 now. It was 12 when you started Bye Bye and, and was propelled onto this world stage that you seem to handle with just ease, right? Just ease. You're an incredible communicator, very clear, uh, very concise, um, very open, right? So how do, you, how do you manage all this limelight time? I think uh, looking back, it's nearly half of my life has been committed to the front lines of change. And when I look at the reason of why I started at a 12 years old, um, it goes back to the fact that the world stages was never the end goal. The end goal was to make Bali plastic bag free. And that was the intention, the pure intention behind what me and my sister, shout out to my sister who's in the shout audience. Out. Shout out, shout out. You know, at 10 and 12 years old, we started this organization nearly 10 years ago yeah. from this place of pure intention and this simple, or so we thought, goal of making our island home of Bali plastic bag free. And I think that that, that intention, that authenticity was what resonated to so many people and got us those invitations to all those world stages. How I stay grounded and um, how I handle that is just by tuning into the frequency of Bali. And that's, I think, something we can all recognize. The reason of why we do what we do is from a place of love. And I think that tuning back into that every time I come home, it's a it's mandatory to do a beach walk or to swim in the ocean and remind myself of why I'm doing it. Yeah. You know, like you have this wonderful mix, right? So your dad's Indonesian, your mom is, is Dutch. You know, again, wonderful mix. And you said before that Bali uh, is a place that you call home. And obviously the Bye Bye Plastic Bags and it was in Bali, uh, started in Bali. And, you know, what is it you think uh, about Bali that gives you this sense of home, the sense of peace? Mm, yeah, it's definitely that third culture aspects of mom being from Holland, dad being from Surabaya, growing up here on Bali. Um, you know, we grew up in a house 100 meters from the ocean, falling asleep every night with the sounds of the waves, but also just this, I think everybody just feels it when you're on Bali and when you're on that level of being connected to the natural world, this is the best place to grow up. You have the ocean, you have the beaches, you have the rice fields, the mountains, the lakes, it's all here. And so I think it's really the nature on Bali that makes me feel the most at home. Yeah. And then what would you say if, by the way, it doesn't need to be the answer, but it's just coming up, as you know, through, not from, <laughs> which attributes do you think came from which parent? Oh my gosh, okay. Um, and also, shout out to my mother who is in the audience. <laughs> no pressure. Um, no, <laughs> but I think, I mean, I, it is definitely both parents had, you know, left their homes to create a home and a world for me and my sister. Um, they both come from very big families, so the the value of family is, has been a core growing up. Um, but also, 
they both started their own adventures and were very entrepreneurial. Everybody always assumes that my parents worked at the United Nations or were like, you know, um, eco activists beforehand, but. They were? No, they weren't. <laughs> um, but they both had this endless, op like, open mindedness about what you could achieve because anything is possible if you put your mind and your heart to it. So that's how my sister and I were raised. My mother um, taught me the fact that communication is key. If you want to go anywhere in life, you yeah. have to be able to articulate what you're thinking and mobilize people through clear communication. So I think that's the biggest lesson and attribute there. And I think my dad is very much Indonesian, like going with the flow, understanding like as a very serious 12 year old starting Bye Bye Plastic Bags, mm -hmm. he was the one who taught, teaches me every day still to, to go with the flow. And sometimes you have to pivot if the plan doesn't go the way you want it. Wow. You know, so there's uh, another um, friend in common that, that, that we have. And I remember her parents, you know, she was an incredible, it still is because she's still alive. She's what, maybe the same age, maybe a little bit older. I don't, I don't remember. But, you know, she was like a multimillionaire at like 14 or something and, you know, like sustainable fashion. Her mom is a powerhouse. But the thing which, which hung with me, um, with her, was that they said, look, when we brought up our daughter, maybe this is a message for your mom, but it's okay, we'll get it up later. Um, it was about this, you know, we're often, you know, at those key ages of life, are like asked or told or instructed, you know, like, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? You know, what is it you want, who is it you want to become, right? And, and these parents had a different way of, of seeing that. And for them, it was like, no, no, no. What is it that you want to be now? Mm. What is it that you want to be now? And they focused on that. And she was like, I want to create this sustainable fashion label. And it did very, very well and all the rest of that. So if there was, you know, like a nugget or two of wisdom that came from either mom or dad, that is something that you think about and it's like, you know what? That thing was the thing that helped to steer me. Um, and this, perhaps the successes that I've had, I think in part were due to that. What would you say? Well, oh, there's so much. But I think, because um, I think, I mean, again, a hint to a vision and idea, I think that my parents or my mom specifically should be releasing very soon. But that's her own story is a book on what it is like to be a parent and what, I mean, everybody assumes, what did you feed them? No. But, did you feed them? <laughs> but I think talking about food, one of the biggest shaping yeah. moments for me and my sister was as simple as it might seem as dinner every day, every night around the dinner table and having conversation. And that, those conversations at the end of a very long school day or at the end of a long weekend, those dinner conversations and the element of my parents taking me and my sister both so seriously and so interested in the simple daily activities of what we were interested in, involved in, curious about. Those conversations, I think, one, allowed me to develop the ability to articulate, but also made me ask bigger questions and showed a developing sense of curiosity as well. And I think that that's, looking back, um, something that I think my parents did very on a small scale, but contributed in the end very big to who my sister and I are today. Beautiful takeaway. And, and you know, because the questions don't come from me, right? They come through me. You know that, Malati. So the question that comes up is that, you know, like, what did you find back in those days, right? What, looking back, what did you find one of the most difficult things to handle um, that stand out for you? You know, the most difficult Again, you're asking so many questions with so many answers that I could go in different directions. The one that comes up for you, the, yeah, the strongest. Yeah, I was going to say, the one that's coming through me right now is definitely this feeling of starting at 10 and 12 years old. We were so small, two little girls, starting this movement, of course, with a you know, a group of other friends and uh, like-minded people that were s coming onto this movement. But I think one of the biggest challenges for me at the time, and when I look back, it's kind of a silly thing, but I definitely felt that uh, the challenge for me at the time was entering spaces and being met with, aw, so cute, so inspir inspiring, girls, well done. And then it was like, okay, but 
Did you hear what we, what we want? We're serious. We're not going to go away until we see what we want achieved. And I think that that was a lesson as well that we had to come to terms with, that change doesn't happen overnight. And that was so frustrating because as at 10 and 12 years old, you know, we learned 40 countries around the world ban single-use plastic bags. So we thought, come on, Bali, come on, Indonesia. We can do it too. And why on earth would it take so long? So I think that that was a very big challenge for me to grow up with and to understand that there's actually so many more complexities than I had imagined in the first place before getting started. Yeah. You know, like, uh, it's interesting because, you know, as you mentioned, it was difficult for you because of not being maybe taken seriously, right? That may happen to other um, young women or young boys growing up during that time. So what was... You know, often there's moments in our lives, right, that, that you look back and say, you know, that was a moment, the first time outside of my parents, where someone took me seriously. Mm. And that gave me the inertia, that pull or that drive to say, you know what, it's working, keep going. Mm. What would be that experience for you? Ah, uh, well, you know, to that point, it got, it got to such a scale that actually the tagline of Utopia, the new company, is serious about change. <laughs> Because exactly that, young people, is uh, where I got that moment, that feeling of confirmation. It was, you know, no matter how many conferences I would be on or stages I would be on, the place that I felt where the most impact was received um, was when I was in a classroom in front of my peers, in conversation, having really deep, difficult conversations about change and that it's not happening but one specific moment. I remember being in front of a, you know, a high school auditorium, 300 kids, and then I'm kind of like, oh, okay, you know, you, you're kind of like not sure if it's really getting across. We were in a very far away high school in a city somewhere, and I thought, okay, maybe because they didn't grow up with the beaches, they don't see the sunsets every day like we do here in Bali. They don't, they're not, it's not clicking with them. But afterwards, when we said our thank yous and they were supposed to go back to school or to class, the, it was the longest line waiting to talk to me and my sister and our group of friends because they had the most incredible questions. They were refusing to go back to math class or to English class. And that was where I was like, you know, they, they, it really did click with them. And they were saying that because my sister and I and our group of friends here on the island of Bali could create change, they now felt like they could as well. And so that was like a real big realization where Bye Bye Plastic Bags, you know, became this living example that kids could do things. And suddenly kids from all corners of the world were seeing themselves in our story, and that was for me enough drive to keep on going. Wow. You know, two questions come up. One is you know, about that relevancy, right? So you mentioned you know, you're going around the world talking on stages, right? And, and I, I love you know, being a speaker as well. I know what you mean. You're in a room and it's like a thousand people away, and you're there going, okay. <laughs> looking around going like, well, <laughs> any of these people get what I want to talk about? I mean, I think they've come, so they must be in, in, interested at least in the topic. I mean, not when it's a high school assembly. <laughs> then, they're, then they're just sitting there <laughs> because they have to, and that's a totally different yes. trick to click. But, yeah. yeah. You know, trick, trick to click. I love that one. Um, so, like, what did you find then, uh, you know, for people watching now, what was that defining message that you feel was, you know, it was, yeah, it was common to all. You know, as you mentioned, uh, the high school assembly, I did a, a, a talk at, at Green School uh, with, during a high school assembly, so I know exactly, exactly what you mean. Um, but, but yeah, so like, what was it that you think, you know, connects all these different places in the world and people with different ideologies, backgrounds, cultures, maybe beliefs? Mm. What would that be? What comes up? Oh, it's definitely the fact that we need everybody. And I think this is a, a thought that we do have to break down, especially when we talk about the climate crisis and the solutions that are needed. Of course, not one person or one organization has the solution to solve it all. And I think the narrative that, that makes everybody resonate with is the fact that it doesn't matter what you're passionate about or your skill, your strength, is that the fact is that we need you. Are you an artist? Are you a writer? Are you a researcher? Are you a storyteller? You don't have to start something new or you don't have to become a founder to get involved. And I think that this, especially for the high school students that we were talking to, was a fresh narrative that's too often also from the scrolling and social media, we see this picture to get involved in the climate crisis or to solve the climate crisis. You have to start your own thing. You have to get involved in the front lines very 
front-facing, and that's not for everybody. And it's also not something that we should be celebrating. What we should be celebrating are all the many different skills and the diversity, mm -hmm. because this movement includes or needs to include all of us. Yeah. You know, and we spoke a little bit earlier on about this... Uh, this activism, you know, that, that, hey, you know, about where you are now and where I am now, we found that we go through these times of change and times of redefining who we are, you know. So, so maybe for those people watching, you know, may take us on a bit of a journey um, of, of how you've been redefining um, yourself through, the, through that particular stage. Yeah, 12 to 21. It's, again, nearly half of my life on the front lines, and I think it's definitely that shift that I've learned from how do we go from that, oh, so cute, so inspiring little girls to now a full-time change maker. And I think that one of the things that I've really learned about is, and on what I'm building today with Youthtopia is the sense of community and the sense of celebrating everybody and everyone, because we all have a role to play. And I think the role that I've taken on from 12 to 21 is definitely now um, community building. So Youthtopia's goal is really to become that number one go-to learning platform mm -hmm. for young people to learn how to create change. And that's become my next life's mission for the next probably five years of my life dedicated fully to helping more young people get the skills that they need to be change makers. And I think that that's something in reflection as well. Too often I hear people saying, oh, we need so many more Malatis in the world. No, we don't. We need so many young people feeling empowered and activated and providing the resources that they need because we, again, all have a role to play. So my role is really now to help connect and be that bridge, as we were talking about earlier, um, to those resources, to the funding, to the mentorship, because so many young people want to get involved but don't know where and how to start. So Utopia, in reverse, looking back, I'm creating that for all the 12-year-olds today who want to create change and want to tap into a community that I didn't have when I started. You know, I, I love that project, as you know. And so maybe for those people watching, right, maybe they're watching online, some might be here, you know, like change maker. So firstly, what definition would you give it and then maybe, I don't want to put you too much on the spot today, uh, maybe, you know, like, are, what would be, like, the three to five steps that a person who wants to become a change maker could do? Easy peasy. First one, the easiest, shout out to Utopia's learning platform because it's all free and we have over 100 programs that are created by young people on how they've created change throughout their change making journey. So public speaking, you can learn that on Utopia. Navigating taboos, you can learn that on Utopia. So that's definitely a resource that I would recommend. But the three, I'll, I'll break it down to three tips that I usually share for anybody listening in here tonight or online. To get started on your change making journey, three things. The first one, break it down. Get clear on the type of change you want to achieve. And the more specific you can be, the better. Because we have 17 sustainable development goals and we cannot all like solve them just by one project or one person. So get clear on the focus of change that you want to create. The second one, you can't do it alone. So find a team. And this can be as, you know, I started with my sister. It was just the two of us. And quickly we grew to our best friends and then the friends of our friends. And we became a large group of young people on the island of Bali. So find your team and people who can support you. And last but not least, something that I think is not often talked about is just have fun. Think outside of the box and stay creative. Because the work that we do is serious about change, but you can't let go of the element to connect with people and have them invited into the movement. And how do you do that? You keep it fun. Mm. You know, disappointment, right? <clears throat> Could I see you? I feel you empowered, right? Charging ahead and just have this wonderful energy and vibe and aura about you, okay? So... But disappointment is one thing that maybe younger generations have been maybe accused of as being, you know, not having that resiliency, um, not having the, the grit, the gumption when faced with a door, they run the other way, right? Mm. I'm just, again, just pulling some stuff out of conversations that I've had in the past. So two questions or two pronged question. Uh, one part of it would, would be, you know, what major disappointment have you faced and what did you do or how did you 
find your way through it? Is there a methodology that you use? Is it something that you learned along the way? Is it something you're still working on now? Mm. Oh, definitely. We were just talking about, and this is just a behind the scenes of our conversation before, we're, before this conversation. Um, how do you introduce yourself? And we were talking about titles, and I was, I, I didn't tell you this, but I was yeah. saving it for now because I, it's almost a joke, but I almost introduce myself as a work in progress, a constant work in progress. And this is something, yeah. dealing with disappointment, dealing with challenges is an ongoing life lesson. Yeah. Um, I think that looking back at some of the ways or challenges that have come when it comes to disappointment is, uh, for example, you know, the fact that change is happening far too slowly. This is a very common disappointment that almost every single Gen Z change maker experiences, whether that's through conferences like COP27 or the G20 that just happened, or, you know, almost 10 years working on Bali becoming plastic bag free. Change like this shouldn't take so long. So what do we do about it? How did I handle that? One of the best examples that I can give you is Bali's biggest cleanup. This is an annual, very iconic, symbolic event that happens every year on the island of Bali. It'll be coming up on, in February, 19th of February, for the seventh year in a row. Now that's because seven years ago, I was faced with the hardest disappointment of my life so far. And that was the fact that, again, change is happening too slowly, and I didn't see it translating to real change on the ground. We didn't see the ban coming into place. So we had a team meeting and we were brainstorming with the team of, our, of the, our friends and we were saying, okay, how can we keep this hope alive? How can we keep the movement alive to ban single-use plastic bags on the island of Bali? And someone said around the meeting table very quietly, well, why don't we organize Bali's biggest cleanup? Why don't we get involved, empower anybody who's anybody to get out there on one day and just feel that the movement is there? Because it is. And so that became now one of Bali's largest community-led movements. Um, it's led by all the incredible volunteers that we work with, the partners that we have here on the island, of which there are many incredible organizations who get involved every year. And since then, almost every year, we mobilize 12,000 people in a single day. Um, and it's one of the ways that I regain that hope and regain that energy. And again, going back to the, the tip number three, keep it fun, this is where we again show and invite anybody to get involved. And it's become my favorite day of the year. Beats Christmas and even my birthday. Wow. You know, uh, by the way, you, the audience, will have a chance to ask questions in about five, ten minutes or so. So we'll get a third microphone, and when you get the microphone, point it at your mouth, not like this. Okay. So question going one, one level deeper, right? So the question was, you know, like, because I'm really interested to know how you think. Right? So disappointment comes. Like, do you feel it? Do you embrace it? Do you accept it? Do you toss it aside? Do you say, oh, better things are to come? Or do you go into a shell and put the covers over your head and say, Mom, make me some tea. I'm not coming out for 10 days, right? Uh, and then you find a way to get through it, over it, around it, under it. Like, yeah, I'm interested. I'm curious. So, so what is it that you've done because uh, people will learn from this, right? Yeah. What is it that you've done um, to, to o overcome disappointment on a personal level? Hmm. I mean, I'm happy my mom's not on the panel because she probably have a totally different perspective. But uh, maybe that's uh, Speak Up Monday session number 335. I don't know. Yes. No, but um, personally how I handle this, and, and I think this is sometimes... To be honest, even as a speaker, I don't really go deeply into my personal thought process. No, no, but it's, it is interesting, and I think it's also part of how a lot of young change makers cope with a lot of this challenges and things like that, because I think one of the more recent disappointments that I've had, what I've learned through that is, yeah, you sit with that disappointment, and it's a lot easier to stay with the negative feelings than the positive feelings and celebrate what's already been done. Um, but I think that once you kind of sit with it, you're also able to reflect where all of those feelings are coming from and why. And the next step that I then do after I'm done feeling sorry for myself or sad for the movement or sad for the world is start conversations. And I think that this is so incredible, especially in the sense of like community building, to feel like you have people that you can count on no matter what has been the most like biggest joy at the end of the day of the work that I get to do every day with these change makers. And you know, last week I was dealing with a very big challenge and I was kind of 
almost to a point of like paralysis, stuck on knowing what to do and what decision to make, and then leaning on the community and literally having phone call after phone call after phone call, and getting other people's advice, other people's opinions. You see it from a different perspective, and then you can pick up your boots and you keep on going because the, the, the one common drumbeat that Gen Z feels and hears is that we don't have the luxury of time. Everything is going to happen in our lifetime, good or bad, and it's up to us to decide which future we work towards. So I think with that pressure, it's a lot bigger than us. It's a lot bigger than how we are feeling. And once we're done going through that emotion because it's only human, we organize, we mobilize, and then we keep on going. Love that. You know, it's like uh, kind of crowdsourcing solutions, yeah. you know. But, but again, it's that openness to be vulnerable with your community and say, hey, look, I've got, I'm having a tough moment here and I can't figure out what the way forward is. Mm. I need help. What do you guys think? You know, and then they come back with those thoughts that then keeps this energy in motion, right? And then once it starts going, it keeps going, gets going, and spins off all these wonderful solutions. Love that. Ooh. You know, last question before we go to the audience. You know, um, yeah, like two-sided again, because you know, you know me, but, but by now there's always two pronged to a question. Maybe, maybe it's a balance or something. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so one is, you know, like, which skill at, attribute do you feel you probably should have learned by now is one side. And the second side to that question is young people coming into it now, what kind of attributes would you say and values that they would need to have to really go all, all the way like, like you have? Oh, okay. Answering the second question first, I think that young people, there's so much excitement at the moment and also willingness to get involved that sometimes I feel like a lot of, well, a lot of the times we do see things starting without that long-term commitment in check. So I think that this is something that, again, comes with the thought process that you don't have to start something yourself. I would very much encourage to volunteer or to you know, participate at events and understand what level of change making you want to do and what you feel good at because it's gonna, it, it takes a lot of commitment. And I think that that's a skill or attribute or value that I think a lot of us need to understand because it's a lifelong journey. And I think what I should learn by now, oh, so many things, it's a, it's a long to-do list. Um, the, one, the one that's most alive for you. I think, Recently as well, because uh, probably just reflecting on what these last two years has been like, also going, you know, 12 to 21, one of the biggest shifts is, um, you know, having a full-time team that are there instead of only volunteers, which was an incredible space to start off in and jump in. But like learning team management and how that works to build and to keep on the long term when you're so like fast paced in a vision that you see, it's sometimes hard for me to translate that. So I think that's probably something in a very like open and vulnerable place right now that I would reflect on that I hope or wish I would have learned by now more strongly. Thank you so much, Malati. I really, yeah, you're such an incredible person. It's, Thank it's, you. It's, it's a pleasure. Pleasure. Mom, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sister Ayu, have we got the third mic? Yeah. Yeah, already? Cool. There. Okay. So, what we're going to do, so if you have a question, don't be shy. By the way, we will have afterwards, you know, like a little bit of time for private questions that won't be on camera or on microphone, right? Um, but if you have a question, is that a question? Or are you raising it? Good. Yeah. Okay, we'll start over here. Yeah. So, yeah, oh. just slide, slide, slide that, that, that one up. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jan. Oh. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for such an inspiring speech. Uh, I was wondering if you have any solution regarding plastic problem in Bali in terms of locals using lots of plastic for the ceremonies. And it's a very sensitive subject because you can never interfere them and say, hey, you just literally threw plastic candy in the ocean because that's such a sacred moment for them. But then we all realize that the change needs to be done on some higher level. So, I don't know, Banja or whoever is managing the community there. Um, it di so my question is, did you ever do any initiative from the side? And uh, do you see any solution? Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, and again, I think looking back at the history, the strengths of Bye Bye Plastic Bags is that we were youth-led and that we focus very much on changing mindset and education. Um, there are a lot, I mean, to your point, it does have to change from a top down on a scalable uh, systems change that we need to see. I don't know if any of you listening in know that there's actually a ban on single-use plastic bags, straws, and styrofoam here on the island of Bali, and this is thanks to the effort of so many incredible organizations. There's no way that Bye Bye Plastic Bags was involved in the actual law-making process, but again, changing mindset and education as a youth-led organization was our strength. Um, but the implementation of this law is very poor. That's where so much work needs to be done, and our, our, we are far from finished. And I think that this is also the frustration of a lot of organizations who are also very heavily involved on the more ceremonial um, local village level experience this. Um, and I think that there's a lot of work, for example, Sungai Watch um, is an organization active here and they work quite a bit on um, with the local communities to influence the ceremonies, they work with the priests, and so I think that that's, there's lots being done. Um, the weekly cleanups, obviously, of Trash Hero, um, Echo Bali and their community Bank Sampa programs. There's so many organizations tackling it from many different um, angles, and I think that this is also very much the strength that we see in Bali, but specifically working on ceremonies, um, I'm not sure who has spearheaded that other than small campaigns on the side here and there that we've seen. You know, one thing uh, that, that comes in as well, another mutual friend of ours, uh, Janur, um, Plastic Exchange, I actually really like his approach, so he's this, uh, he's been on the show, I think, three, three times, and um, so his approach is like a martial artist approach, right? That, that one, I may not get the numbers completely correct, but just go with me here, okay? Go with me, right? It's, it's like this. It's like when you learn a new move, right, maybe 10 times, you won't really remember it, but you have a, a recollection. If you learn that move 100 times, then you'll have a memory of it. If you learn that move 1,000 times, it will begin to become second nature 10,000 times as muscle memory, and you do it automatically, so with Plastic Exchange, it's about plastic, but actually what it's really about is changing habits. Yeah. That's actually what's at the core of Plastic Exchange. So what he's saying is that on a local level, maybe the village, maybe we'll handle plastic maybe four or five times a day. Maybe that's from this to this, to separation. So four or five times a day, and you keep doing the numbers. So eventually, in the same analogy I gave you before, you begin then to change a habit. Mm -hmm. But it takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, again, 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times, the habit's then changed yeah. and away we go. So I think that's also part of the, part of the answer um, is that methodology which he employs, which I think is brilliant, actually. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, that's an incredible project that they've started. And, um, you know, to your point as well, and also to your point, it, it will take time. And I think just reflecting on a lot of the content that I shared tonight is that's the biggest frustration, but also fear. Yeah. And I think where a lot of we where we leave room for disappointment, yeah. that the, the, the world we're living in is changing so fast. The climate crisis isn't coming. It's already here. Yeah. And that's where we need stronger leadership from a policy perspective and where we are seeing more of the leadership coming from the grassroots. And that's again where we can underestimate that people power are more powerful than the people in power. So just let that sink in. But it is definitely where in a country and cultural like Indonesia, there's so much power when we can influence places like ceremonies. And I think that it is not a difficult well, it's not a challenging topic to discuss because I think that everybody here on the island of Bali is now at a state of mind where we do not want to be the plastic island. And there's a level of awareness that has shifted so much because of the work of so many of these organizations that we see this level of awareness. People understand, people know, but again, the solutions need to be more accessible. If we say no to plastic bags, what are the alternatives? If we want to throw our plastic in a bin, who's collecting the plastic from the bin? Once it goes to a TPA, what's the process over there? So this is also something that I've learned not getting involved in too intensely, but what I learned getting involved with Bye Bye Plastic Bags, saying no to plastic bags is just the first step. It's not, you know, it's like step 000.1. It's getting your foot in the door to a larger conversation on 
waste management, waste separation, waste collection. And there are so many incredible, again, grassroots organizations who are getting involved either on the behavioral side or on the system side. But again, this is where we need to see a more scalable, systemic, collaborative effort to really make sure that it's a solution that includes everybody. You know, the practical steps, right? So we've, we've heard tonight about the, what I refer to for this episode as like a youth movement, right? Um, we've spoken about you know, the fact you know, of some of the main challenges that that movement faces about time, about immediacy, about this need to do it, right? Um, we've spoken about you know, this collaborative effort. So what I can see is that you have different generations which are cohabiting on the planet right now, right? And there are some people maybe from my generation and beyond, right, who don't care. They just don't care because they just don't care. No problem. But there's also a percentage of those ones who do care. And they do want to see change and they do want to ensure the life of their kids. I have two, six and eight, as I told you before. Um, and we do want to see that they don't inherit a world they can't live in, right? So then what would you say are the practical steps which, and this is about, because you're a giver, right? And sometimes as a giver, so am I. Um, we find it hard to be contributed to, which I think you got cracked because you said before about I crowdsource solutions. Well, I love that. Come on, Malati. Love it. So, so the question is, you know, like, what could be the practical steps, no matter what the generation that, that you're in, how can we contribute to what you're doing? I think definitely always looking for resources of support whether that's your time, your energy. I mean, Bye Bye Plastic Bags would not be here today if it wasn't for the incredible support that we got from the community. We had many mentors. We had many people who were uh, willing to contribute their ideas, their thoughts into the movement. Um, so definitely, we're still active. We have an office in Sese. Um, it's five recycled shipping containers piled on top of each other, solar powered, permaculture garden out front. And we're always looking for people who want to help uh, contribute to our many different programs. Um, I will put a shout out for the Bali's Biggest Cleanup. This is an upcoming uh, program and event that we have and we are looking for coordinators. So if you would like to, again, this is fully community led. If you would like to host a cleanup, we're looking for coordinators at the moment. You can organize a cleanup anywhere you want on the whole island. We have the map of Bali full of red dots of cleanups happening on the same day, February 19th. And I think a more general note to how to embrace or open the youth movement, as you said this session is about, I think have a conversation with a young person in your life and ask them what they're interested in. Those simple conversations, going back to the beginning of, my con of our conversation of what shaped me and my sister, is the genuine interest from our parents having these honest and open conversations. And I think that that's something that could be really helpful to somebody in your community. Love that. You know, maybe, and by the way, any other questions? We're going to have two or three more. Um, maybe this is the hardest one. I don't know. They, they come through, not from. I keep saying that. So, like, your mom's here, okay? Mm -hmm. Your mom, your dad, your sister, right? So, maybe you said to her already, but, like, if your mom wasn't here sitting in front row, right? No pressure, mom. Right. Uh, no pressure, me. <laughs> I'm looking at <laughs> what, mom. What are you going to ask? I'm looking at mom. Uh, right. So, like, you've come so far to where you are now. What message would you give her in terms of, again, I don't want to sculpt this message too much, but of gratitude, what would you say? Well, yeah, I was going to say the one thing that I s would like to say is thank you. And, you know, my mom, shout out to her, she was just with me uh, traveling for a conference that I had to do on a broken foot. I mean, you know, that, that dedication and that level of being there is enormous. And I think I wouldn't be, you know, half the person I am today if I didn't have her in my life. And it's also to my sister, uh, starting at 10 and 12 years old, she was my biggest cheerleader, my best friend, still is. Uh, every day, every night, here they are as well, being here, showing up, 
And yet our roles have changed. My mom is my biggest mentor. I know everything I do because of her and because she's so patient with me. I'm a very frustrated, you know, Gen Zer who wants to see change happening fast enough. But there's strategy behind that. And I wouldn't have learned it if I didn't have the mentor of my mom and the support of my sister. What would you say to your dad? Thank you for the best curry nights ever, dad. <laughs> No, dad keeps the fort going whenever we're uh, traveling and always makes me the yummiest curry. And that's when, ever, after a long travel, those nights are the nights that I remember the most. Now, other questions? I know you have, Natalie, for sure. Tree. Yeah, so over, over, here, over here to, to Tree. Henry, oh, look at that. He just gets in there first. Go on then. Yeah, okay. Uh, Henry, then, then, then we go to Tree. Otherwise, the microphone will have to go backwards and forwards. Yeah. yeah. Is it on? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. So, first of all, I would also like to say thank you to you, your sister, and your family. Um, I've been to Bali for my first time 15 years ago. And uh, that time, even though I fell immediately in love with the island of gods, uh, two things shocked me the most. Uh, one thing was traffic jam, which is still shocking me even more now. The second thing was um, the waste, especially plastic waste that we saw everywhere. And uh, now, um, thanks to your movement, it became so much better. And now I can say Bali is my home. So I, I really want to say uh, thank you so much. And uh, I've been, to be honest, following your movement since, um, I think, more than eight years when I was still living back in Europe. And at that time, for the same reasons that you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, I was skeptical, to be honest, you know, because you guys were so young, and I knew like how slow things uh, move in Indonesia at that time. I already knew that, so I was like, "Wow, it's great that they are trying that." But probably in a year, no one is talking about about bye bye plastic anymore about you guys. So I'm I'm so happy that that you guys achieved what you have achieved so far, and that you're still on it. So that that's the first thing I wanted to say. Thank you. And now my question. So um, I'm a myself an entrepreneur, um, Rob knows me very well, so we're trying to solve the traffic jam issue here with electric scooters, with uh, stand-up scooters made for the roads. So um, based on my experience, I know that true impact is um, usually only achieved if we are building something up that is not just sustainable from an environmental perspective, but also sustainable from a business perspective. So I'm, I'm really impressed also by uh, Utopia. Um, but I don't know your business well yet, to be honest. So as an entrepreneur, I'm curious, how, how are you and your team making sure that Utopia is still there when you're maybe not full-time committed anymore, let's say, in, in five years? Like, how do you guys get profit out of the whole thing? Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for your very kind words and for your support over the last many years. Um, and also, you know, it, it's thanks to the effort of so many people. Bali is a hot spot for so many local organizations, individuals who are very like-minded and were very active before me and my sister got involved. We were just very lucky by being 10 and 12 and by starting at the right time where the momentum was just right. So being at the right place at the right time. Um, in terms of Utopia and business model, again, as 21 years old, nobody teaches you this in high school, although they should, and that's now what we're teaching at Utopia. Um, it was a learning by doing process. Uh, at first, of course, you kind of go into it very naively. Bye Bye Plastic Bags for sure is an NGO and a non-for-profit. But we learned the hard way. If there were no funds from friends, fools, or family, there was no car ride to the event. There was no shirts that you could print to sell. So it was like this ongoing hamster loop of trying to get funds available for the work that you want to do. Now with Utopia, I was like, okay, I got to do something differently. So at first, the vision, I mean, still the vision very very much the heartbeat of Utopia is to be that free learning platform. But as soon as you say the word free, entrepreneurs and investors and you know business people are like ding, 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 ding. How, how are they making money? And to your question, how is it sustainable when I am no longer there or there is no longer that involvement? Um, so Utopia has developed a program where just as the young people were asking me and my sister at the end of a presentation, how can we create change, suddenly, CEOs and business managers, general managers, were asking the very same question. In our closed door meetings, board meetings, they would say, okay, great, but how do we as a company get involved in creating change? And so that's where my brain goes, ding, 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 ding. And we created a program called Utopia Shift, where we do a reverse mentorship 
four CEOs that are led fully by young facilitators on how they should narrative, uh, change their narrative and position sustainability at the core of everything they do, but also how they can learn from young people about the priorities and about the leadership that we wanna see. And so this is an 18 month program with five modules that we've developed and now with a price tag, ask businesses to give to Utopia. And in that way, we're able to run everything for free for the audience and for the young people that we are working towards empowering. So that's a little bit enterprise-wise how we figured it out. Thanks for the question. We'll pass that mic on to Brother Tree. Mind the cables over there, guys. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll get it there. Maybe you want to stand up, Tree? There you go, brother. Oh, that, that looks interesting. My God, is it like that? Okay, we're, we're, we're playing past the cable under the table. By the way, friends, fools, and family. I'm going to remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> friends for the three Fs. Yep. Are, are you a friend? Are you a fool? Are you family? Or, or both? Yeah. All, all three, sorry. Okay, tree over to you, mate. Okay, thank you, uh, Malati. Um, I'm also, you know... Sometimes I'm involved with the sustainability in Ubud area. Um, I'm just curious about the reusable, uh, reusable and recycle thing. And um, I'm just curious about uh, what is your present uh, a program to to produce, let's say, from plastic to something new, mm -hmm. and then. Um, uh, is really usable. What is your uh, present uh, project for now? And then for the upcoming future, do you have like any a kind like uh, long term project of it? Because uh, what I see, as we know in Bali, like now it's like everywhere in the village, like in my village, just less plastic. No, Be because the, the habit of the people, we are Balinese uh, before plastic coming, our uh, habit is just because we use usually, when, I'm, 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 when I was a kid, everything is like a uh, wrapper is by banana leaves, something like that, by young coconut leaves, something like that. But uh, in their uh, mind is still like when you throw away something, you know, you just wherever you want to throw it because it's, it's a, re a recycle and bi biodegradable. I mean, sorry. So then they their habit in in a village is still the same way when they how they uh, uh, implement. I mean, how they treat the plastic is same way the way they treat the you know, uh, the biomass, like uh, the green material. So this is also, is very, very important for, for, for Bali and then for the young generation. So what is your long-term uh, program? Okay. okay, thank you. Terima kasih, Pak Tri, and I would love to learn more about the sustainability projects that you're working on in Ubud. Um, I think for me, to answer the uh, first question about the reduce and reuse recycle, I think for now, the ongoing projects that we have, um, first of all, we are very big believers that now there are about 10 R's. It's not only reduce, reuse, recycle. It's refuse, redesign, rethink. There are so many R's. And um, one of the projects that we have where we turn uh, it's not, we don't work in terms of like turning plastic into something else, but we do have a social enterprise called Mountain Mamas, which is where we say bye-bye to plastic bags and we say hello to the alternatives. And those alternatives are made from pre-loved materials and donated materials. So for example, fashion factories that have offcuts share their uh, material with bye-bye plastic bags and we bring it to the mountains where we work in um, a village on the slopes of Mount Batukaru and we uh, empower the women in that local community to produce alternative bags. And the cool thing about Mountain Mamas is that we um, pay each woman individually for the bag that she makes, so fully in charge on a leadership, also voluntary scale. If they make five bags, they get paid for five bags. If they make 15, they get paid for 15. And we don't just stop there. The sales profit of these Mountain Mama bags go 50% back to Bye Bye Plastic Bags as an NGO. 
and 50% back, not to the women, but to the community where the women are from. And that gets put into a budget for waste management, healthcare, and education. So there we see the circle coming round. And that's a, a little project that we've got going on in Bali. And we also just opened in Surabaya, in Siduarjo, which is something we're really proud of and work very closely with the Dessas and all of the people in the community to make sure that it works. Um, then in terms of my long-term vision and projects, um, yes, I think that it's definitely, as you said, but you know, first we threw the down pisang and now it's the plastic. And it's also what we heard before and the, the message of the rhythm, the body muscle memory is almost we don't think about the consequences because when we throw away, we don't ask where away is. Away equals the rice fields, the rivers, the oceans, the beaches, and we know this. And so a large part of it has to do with, again, education and changing mindset. Policy is a whole other thing, but where my impact will be in the next future vision is um, 2023 and 2024, I'm on a mission to empower and educate one million eyes and ears here in Indonesia, focusing purely on the change of curriculum, Curriculum Merdeka, which for those of you that don't know, finally Indonesia has made a national curriculum change to be more hands-on, project-based, and peer-to-peer. -peer. So this is something for the long-term vision of what I'll be involved in, spending a lot of time in classrooms, but with young people here in Indonesia. Man, yeah. Um, so many goosebump moments. You don't know, but I'm here having these goosebumps. You know, another one. Oh, another one. Oh, there you go. another one. Um, <laughs> So on that, of the, the G20, B20, O20, which is Oceans 20, uh, Tarihe Forum, one of the most um, innovative, brilliant things which I saw was actually the Digital Transformation Expo, right? So for those of you, does anyone, did anyone go and see that? You probably did. No, you didn't. Shame on you. So did anyone go and see the Digital Transformation Expo at G20, B20, no one? Cool, okay, check it out. It's a website, um, so Digital Transformation Expo. I've repeated it four times, so you should get it by now. Uh, look, what I would say is this, physically how it presented itself was a bit like when you go, and you, you go to an attraction, right? So you have like four or five viewings a day and you have X amount of people who go in each time with a space in between. And then while you're inside, you just move around these different installations and then come out the other side. Mm. That's what it was like physically. So, but the rest of it is incredible. So internally, uh, one of the displays or the installations was like a lead screen, which I would say would be maybe two and a half to three meters high and around about 20, 25 meters long. Huge, right? And basically, I challenge anybody in the world to be dropped in there, not know where they are, and watch what went, watch what happened. So it is the digital transformation technology which is underpinning Indonesia as a whole into the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Blew my mind. So, because a lot of people... Maybe we don't realize that Indonesia is about to become the largest, the fourth largest economy in the world, the largest economy in Southeast Asia, and a whole bunch of socioeconomic factors that make it one of the best places on earth to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some people, and I'm referred to friends of mine, I won't mention them by name. They don't live here. They live in other, other parts of the world. But they have this idea about Indonesia that's so far removed from what it actually is that it makes me laugh. So if I would drop them in and say, look, watch this they would come out like true believers, right? It's phenomenal. And Itchy was actually with me. Remember Itchy, the digital transformation expert? Yeah. And we saw it together. And both of us had the same, like, wow, that was amazing. And that's one of the tools which is available to you now. There was one other guy on the show, um, Marlo Bandam. He's the, his family have stick on Bali. Um, Stick Stickholm University, sorry. Uh, he's an educator. He's a keeper of the Bali archives. A wonderful, wonderful man. Brilliant man, like Balinese as well. And again, we have these conversations, right, about education because at the end of the day, that's what separates people, right? Education is one of those fundamental things that if you get it right, it's phenomenal. If you get it wrong, it's a prisoner. 
you know, so just hearing your response to the question over here of what you have planned going forward to get to the root of it. It's like functional medicine. You go to the root of what's causing it. Playing around on the surface is great, but if you really want to affect change and be a, be a real change maker in that sense, you've got to go to the root. So, so it's just really happy to kind of hear, hear that and uh, looking forward to the next years that come. Stay tuned. Lots, so much to do. I mean, just talking to, you know, the vision of Indonesia in the future. In my head, I was thinking you were going to go in a totally different direction. I thought, oh my God, did this digital thing show that we were underwater? Because again, the, the potential here in Indonesia is a double-edged sword. At the same time as being one of the world's largest youth populations with so much endless innovation, you know, innovation, the the possibilities is endless. And at the same time, Indonesia has one of the highest, in fact, if not the largest number of climate deniers in the world. Wow. How can that be a reality? But it goes back to the fact that, that yeah. the connection, the understanding, because education is one thing, but if we do not understand it, it's hard for us to connect with it. And if we don't connect with it, we don't change. And I think that this is something where, in the film Bigger Than Us, the movie poster that was at the Cannes Film Festival is of me uh, on a wall um, in Jakarta. And if you don't know, Jakarta is sinking. Our capital city is sinking. And uh, the movie poster, literally the thumbnail of it, is me on, on a wall that was built to protect the community from the rising sea levels. And this is a sinking wall. It's a sinking part of the, uh, of the city. And... Um, when I was having conversations with the local community there, I asked the Ibu, I said, what's happening? Like, why, why are we seeing this wall here? And it was trickling, you know, the, the ocean was literally trickling in. And she said, um, Mulati, you know what? It's the ocean, the ocean is leaking. And I literally sat in front of her thinking, how can someone say that the ocean is leaking? What is happening here? And it, that gives me goosebumps because I'm so, this is one of my biggest fears, that change is not happening fast enough in a country like Indonesia because we are not empowering each other with the knowledge that we know exists. Science tells us that climate change is here. Indonesia will experience, is experiencing climate refugees today because the ocean is leaking and it's leaking fast. So it goes back to that analogy is that if you're in a room and the tap is on and it's flooding, you get higher and higher meters of water, you're about to lose your air, do you keep throwing the bucket out or do you turn off the tap? It's much more convenient for us to forget that the tap exists, but it does. And when we look at solutions, we cannot solve the problem with the same thinking that created it. So it's time for us to think outside of the box, empower the people with the education, have them understand it and create solutions that are including for everybody. Ooh. On that note, I think that's a good place to finish. <laughs> if that wasn't too much. Wow. <laughs> Mamma mia. So look, um, Natalie, do you have a question? If you don't, it's okay. You're, you have a couple. All right, we'll do that in a private session. So look, uh, last question for, from me, and we, we managed to keep to an hour today, which is amazing, so much information. So... As a kind of closing, you know, like, you've spoken a lot about the future, okay? You've spoken a lot about, you know, how we can begin to tackle this challenge that's ahead of us. You've spoken about your own personal journey throughout this, ab about how, you know, being from 12 to, to 21, the, the internal changes that are happening with you. You spoke about, you know, why plastic, why plastic bags came up, bye-bye, right? You also spoke about why Youthtopia is a time for that, and it's a, it's a platform, a way for you peer to peer to give back this knowledge in a way that others can be empowered to speak their voice, right? To speak their truth. So, with all of that, is there anything else left that you'd like to leave people with as a thought, or a feeling, or a hope, or a wish? I think. Again, reflecting to a very common feeling that a lot of us, I think, experience. Gen Z, 70% of us experience climate anxiety. This overwhelming sense that there's nothing that we can do, this doom that's very easy to fall into. I think the message that I want to leave everybody with is lead with love. Don't let that fear hold you back from the change that we know is possible. 
And if you need to find inspiration, lean into the young generation because we are resilient. We, we step into that fear, but translate it into love. Yeah. So leaving this room tonight, I hope everybody leads with love and leads by example because we need that change to happen tonight, tomorrow, the day after that, and that consistency needs to continue. Round of applause, everybody. Malati Rianto, Wissen. Thank you. Well done.